So, um, hi, I'm Delene. I'm a software engineer and lead at Tyro Payments, and I work in one of our, one of our iOS teams. Originally, I was a Java developer, but for the last kind of almost two years, I've been working in an iOS team, coding predominantly for iOS, kind of helping Tyro build its business banking solution. Um, welcome all. My name is Carol. I'm an iOS developer. I'm working for ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks is an ID, a global ID consulting company. We have companies, uh, we have offices everywhere, and we play with many different technologies. But um, I specialize in iOS and Android sometimes. Um, so as a consultant in ThoughtWorks, uh, for the last few months, I had the opportunity to work with um, fascinating clients, such as Deline and her team in Tyro Payments. Um, we also helped, uh, I also helped deliver an update of the app with the capability of land, uh, landing a loan in which uh, the merchants can just um, borrow tens of thousands of dollars in a few clicks, which is really cool. Um, today, though, we'd like to go through with you how we applied architecture to the iOS app and how we learn things the hard way. Cool. So I'm just going to kind of give you all a very kind of high level overview about kind of the iOS team at Tyro and kind of what we do with regards to software engineering, because it might be different to what you guys are used to in your day to day jobs. So, this is the team um, at Tyro Payments who work on iOS, and we're actually two teams now, and there's a few, um, few new faces in the mix because the company's growing quite, quite rapidly. So, a bit about kind of software engineering, kind of what we do on a day to day. We're predominantly, for the most part, a Java shop that kind of has a strong background in collective code ownership test-driven development, continuous integration, and pair programming. We believe the quality is the responsibility of each of the delivery teams. So kind of at our organization, you're not going to find any dedicated test teams per se. So being mainly a Java shop, when we first started building our iOS app, we didn't have any dedicated iOS team. In fact, we didn't have any iOS developers. What we had was a bunch of Java developers who were good at building back-end systems and maybe a handful, two or so of us, who had dabbled in iOS on the side at home, but nothing kind of commercial. So we had to kind of bring across what we knew from Java, and so we brought across the experiences and best practices, practices that we'd applied in Java to iOS. So that kind of meant that from day one, we've had CI and tests in place, which I've heard is kind of a bit unusual for mobile development. And along the way, we've adopted tooling such as Fastlane into our pipeline. So what does a day-to-day -day kind of developing kind of involve? Developers write the automated tests. And in terms of tests, we have quite a number of tests. They kind of vary from unit to integration to UI and pack tests, which I'll talk a bit more about later. We also have manual smoke tests that we complete before each App Store release. And we don't have feature branches, so everyone works off master. And kind of because of this, we want to make sure that you know, every developer pair working on a feature checks that the build passes on their local machine before they push. So what does that mean? It means that, in short, tests are being run all the time. Um, either a pair of developers at their local machine or on Jenkins as part of CI. And the reason we want that, sorry, as a result of that, we want tests to run fast and we also want them to give confidence in what our app does. So you might be wondering kind of, why? Um, why do we have all these processes and practices? And that's because the, thing, the app that we're developing is a, business, is, a, is a business banking app. And for our customers, it's the only way that they can pay their bills and access their funds. <coughs> so this means we need confidence in what the app does, that it does what it says on the tin. And our business banking platform is also mobile only. So this means that for our, for our merchants, if the banking app doesn't work or isn't available, they can't access their account. And this can have kind of dr drastic results for us small to medium kind of businesses who use Tyro. They may not be able to pay their staff wages, they may not be able to pay their bills. So this means we need to mitigate risk and we need to have quality and confidence. So we had great success in Java land in our back-end systems. Why didn't, work, why didn't the first pass work out quite the same for us with iOS? It turned out that what eventually, happening, ha what eventually happened for us over the course of a year and a year and a half, year and a half was that productivity ended up being one of our main issues. So TDD, automated tests and all that, it sounds awesome when it works efficiently. But the rea reality ended up happening for us that a whole test suite was 
taking close to 30 minutes to run. So what ended up happening was the gradual loss in pr productivity. And the team of developers being you know, mad and sad. We liked what we worked on. We liked that we were coding for iOS. But that build time, we had better things to do. And this is because as we're growing kind of the bank of product, this meant that every new feature we added resulted in additional tests. And additional tests meant that those tests had to run. Alongside this, it soon became clear that we had a bunch of flaky tests. And they were consuming time to you know, kind of investigate and fix. And that kind of resulted in kind of a cascading effect because our practice of continuously integrating was taking a hit. Builds were intermittently failing, so that meant that pairs were going to have to stop working on the story they were working on to investigate the build. And the reason kind of why it was kind of down tools is that a breaking build meant that no one else should commit to CI. CI best practices say don't check in when the build is broken. And that's because if you're the pair investigating the broken build, how do you know if you, you know, fixed the problem that originally, you know, caused Jenkins to fail? Or how did, did you find a new problem? And additionally, because we work off master, we want to be able to kind of cut an app release at any point in time. So if we've got this flaky build going, how do we know that when I cut a, cut a release tomorrow, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? So the end result was code that wasn't committed for days, large code commits, and merge hell with the Xcode, pro Xcode project file and storyboard, which we were using at the time. So because we're continually kind of growing our engineering team at Tyro, including the iOS teams, we could see that slow tests were gradually costing us a fortune in time and money. You know, if you think about a 30 minute test, um, test build run five times a day by a pair, that's already quite significant, it's 150 <coughs> minutes. Um, start kind of adding those numbers up over a team of say five pairs, six pairs, seven pairs, and you suddenly, suddenly can see that it's a fairly big issue. So whilst we're creeping out for 30 minutes, it was a major pain to the whole team, and we decided, rather than wait for it to kind of, you know, be this really big problem, we better start looking at it now. So when I joined the team, it was the right time to address these issues. There wasn't as much uh, delivery pressure compared to a year ago, when they really needed to deliver that banking app. Um, in order to figure out where the problem lies, though, or if there are any quick fixes, we did a bunch of benchmarking and uh, analysis. So we tried... Um, sorting and categorizing the tests by the time taken, and looking if the slow tests had anything in common, such as those hitting the network and those requiring several view state changes, transitions. Um, we also tried to pinpoint bottlenecks in the code. For example, there might be points where we introduce unnecessary delays um, to make flaky tests pass. This could happen when there were asynchronous timing issues involving the backend simulator. The Get Backend Simulator is a part of the backend server that simulates response uh, similar to what happens in production for testing purpose. Uh, finally, we looked at um, what our tests were testing and behaviors that might be covered somewhere um, as a product by product of tests building up over time. But nothing was really too obvious. So we asked ourselves, um, can we do things differently or are we not following best practices? So we um, got everyone into a room and we looked at our test stack and tried to figure out whether we're following a test pyramid. Um, for those who are not familiar with the concept, it's a concept uh, described by Mike Kahn in his book, Succeeding with Agile. Essentially, we should have many more reliable, efficient, um, fast-running unit tests than slow end-to-end -end UI tests, which is at the top of the pyramid because they are at times uh, really brittle and required more initial setup. And everything else that goes between um, our integration tests, that uh, theoretically they um, do not require the UI, but still provide a sense of how well components integrate together. So they help avoid the complexity of UI tests, but should still run faster. So um, we looked at, uh, we as I said, we um, went into a room and then we compared our test stack against the test pyramid. And here's what we got. It's a test boat. So uh, we have a lot of unit tests, but there's also more integration tests. Our integration tests were actually really similar to UI tests, um, only that they test the view controllers logic programmatically rather than through the UI. 
And there's a historical reason for this. Um, because of lack of tooling, SX code did not initially include ways to write native UI tests. Writing UI tests with things like um, Calabash and Appium was such a pain. As a result, there was really um, little UI tests that came later on. And our integration tests were slow because they were testing the view logic on the view controllers, which required a setup of the view hierarchy and therefore the simulator. Simulator launches um, takes two seconds for every launch, and that multiplies for um, how many tests that we have. And many of them were also flaky because we need to make a request to the backend simulator, uh, relying on the correct setup and timing. Um, so many of the integration tests were coupled to each other. So if you run 50 tests, um, and two of these tests change the state of the simulator permanently, then you risk failing the rest of the 48. Uh, regardless, the native UI tests were, also, we were still the slowest because they run at human pace. And we choose not to bypass um, the authentication part because it's for security reasons. And <coughs> below the UI tests are pack tests, um, as Eileen said, we'll explain that later. To make things worse, we actually don't really know our boundaries, and therefore the four categories of tests are overlapping each other and increasing test time unnecessarily. Um, as the team were formerly Java developers, they have a concept they need to um, test all the things in order to have confidence in the quality. So um, we learned that in mobile, in front end testing, we actually need to compromise. And um, here are the things that we learned that did not really work in iOS as a first attempt to fix um, the slow thing, low tests. Uh, first of all, we learned that Apple does not really support concurrency of tests running on sim multiple simulators on the same machine. There's a way to parallelize tests if they're logic tests. Now what that means is, if you go into Xcode and you untick that um, tiny checkboxes uh, on your test target, but our integration tests are so tightly coupled, it can't really live without a host application. And mentioned in the last slide, our integration tests were reliant on the setup of a few hierarchy on the simulator, so we could not avoid uh, either the simulator or the application launch. And it was also time when we start migrating to Swift. There weren't a lot of su uh, supporting libraries or best practice out there for a mixed language app, uh, which is called an uh, interpolating app. And OC mock and Swizzling doesn't really work in Swift. And also dealing with all, these, with all those bridging headers, it was just really hard. So we kind of found out that we had this test boat that wasn't quite what we you know, hoped. And we've, we found out that there was all these constraints. But we still decided to fix it. And that's because the team follows kind of agile processes and practices. And one of the principles of agile is that the team reflects on how effective it is, and then adjusts and tunes its behavior as is necessary. So the team had identified what some of our problems were, and we wanted to spend some time to address and improve the situation now. But we had to kind of sit back and kind of think about how do we improve it iteratively while still being productive and delivering value to the business. When we started doing this investigation, as Carol mentioned, we'd kind of delivered the initial banking solution, and so there wasn't that much kind of important work happening. But by the time we got to this point where we were like, we actually have stuff to do, and it's going to kind of you know, bite us very soon, um, we had a key project alongside, which was lending. And so we had to find the balance between kind of what was achievable given the time and the constraints that we knew about. So we knew we had a project deadline. We knew we had limited resources. There was only so many iOS developers that Tyra had employed. And we knew that the team was going to split into two sometime into the, in the very near future. Um, and then there was a moment we came to realize what we had to do and furthermore set our target of having a 10 minute build. So this is a paragraph from uh, Martin Fowler's a continuous integration that fit exactly our situation. Try to speed up the build, um, try to speed up the commit build. Continuous integration on a build of a few hours is better than nothing, but getting down to that magic 10 minute number is much better. This usually requires some pretty serious surgery on your code base to do as you break dependencies on a slow part of the system. And that last sentence is very important. Um, so it's this time that we realize our, any quick uh, fixes are not really going to work. 
the code base was really only going to grow and become a major tech debt. Only through thinking about how we can uh, fix our architecture and testability, then it would be possible to fix the root cause. So keeping this in mind, we wanted to be agile, and we wanted to figure out how to perform small surgeries, um, which is to come up with a good design that we can migrate to gradually. So kind of at this point, we were kind of all one iOS team now. So previously when we started working on the platform, we were kind of four different teams, and teams did iOS work as required. Uh, but by the time we, we did all this analysis and came to sit together, um, we were one team. So we had the benefit of you know, working together and knowing that we were going to work together kind of for the you know, near future and kind of going forward. So all of us got together and we sat down and started thinking about kind of, we know what the problems are now. We know, you know it is what it is. But kind of what is a clean architecture and what would it look like to the team, the, the team who's working on the app now and into the future? How might we want to implement it? And what did we want to get out of it? So we wanted to get an architecture that would allow us to have easily testable code. We wanted it to be somewhat independent of UI in certain areas, and we wanted it to have minimal external dependencies, again, in certain areas. We also wanted to consider the ramp up time it will take um, for a new developer to get up to speed with the code base. And this is because, as I mentioned earlier, we're continually growing. Um, so kind of getting, getting new employees um, into the team and getting them up to speed is something that we value um, quite importantly. And so what it turned out to uh, be is that it came down to establishing the boundaries within our application, such that each layer had a single responsibility. So some of you might already be familiar with the diagram up on screen. Um, in this diagram, the coloured layers represent a distinct area of concern that's separated from the next. So this kind of means that the inner circles shouldn't know about things in the outer circles. And so the only way the circles can kind of communicate between each other is by a defined API or protocol. So um, just uh, on the side, the team was already trying to decouple the code by migrating to a MVVM pattern. So now how many people know what MVVM is? Cool. Um, so for those who are not familiar, MVVM stands for Model View View Model. It's, a, it's introduced by Microsoft, and it basically allows you to unit test on the presentation logic. So compared to uh, traditional MVC, the default Cocoa pattern, uh, the models hold the data, the view presents an interactive user interface to the user, and the view controllers mediate interaction between the model and the view. And the problem with MVC as we know it is that all the logic goes into the view controller, creating massive view controllers. <coughs> and having these patterns are also the sole reason why we had so many integration testers, because it was the only way to test them. It, and um, MVVM, on the other hand, puts all that logic in the view model, a simple data object that describes what information that views need to display. An MVP, model view presenter, is very similar to MVVM, but it does not require a binding framework such as uh, Reactive Coco. And both patterns are similar in a way that they separate the view from the model, making the presenter or the view model highly testable. So we wanted to keep the positives of the MVVM approach that we'd started using in certain places in our code base. But we wanted to make it kind of slightly better by having clearly defined boundaries between the model view and the view model that would be clear to current and future developers working on the code. So our approach ended up being somewhere between MVVM and MVP with what we called a ports and adapters aspect to it. Um, ports and adapters is essentially an architectural pattern that embodies the clean architecture diagram shown, I think it was two slides ago. Um, a port represents a boundary, and it usually takes its form as an API or contract. Whilst the adapter, on the other hand, um, its job is to form the, kind of the translation between the layers, so that the layers remain independent of each other. So what did this approach end up looking, looking like for us, kind of in a kind of view controller stack? It looks something along the lines of the following. So our controller essentially functions as what we call the viewport, and what is called the presenting MVP, we refer to as the view adapter. So what happens is the view controller talks to a view adapter and stuff happens. So that might be um, a person clicking on a button, you usually might have to go off and make a network call. As a result of the network call, you get data back and you usually want to do something on screen. So when that call comes back from the network, a new view model is created and it's provided back to the view controller via the viewport. 
A nice thing the team liked about this approach was it was quite simple in making it clear to kind of everyone in the team about the principles of having a single responsibility. It also helped us achieve a common language and understanding. So this kind of meant that when pairs were working on code or switching pairs between stories, or when we were in planning and we were talking about what work had to be done, whenever we use kind of viewports of view adapters, everyone in the team and across the two teams knows what we're talking about. So we know what it's talking about, we know how it's going to function, we know what it's going to do. So there's more to it. Um, besides that architecture that Delane just described, we decided to make two more changes. First of all, we decided to make our view models immutable. And we stopped using reactive cocoa, um, not because it wasn't cool, because um, of the other talk, it got me really excited to using it again, but um, because it re didn't really support mixed language. And um, also, it was a really steep learning curve for uh, new developers as well. And this is how we came up with our current architecture. We found our approach quite similar to, as you know, um, Redux. As you can see, uh, data flows in one direction, and we use immutable field models as state to communicate. All in all, we are more comfortable as the system becomes more predictable with this architecture. And of course, um, you may say there's a lot of differences, major differences between the, with the concept, like we don't have a central dispatcher. Um, but we never really considered migrating to Redux because it wasn't a suitable architecture for us. And there would be a lot of boilerplate uh, code, code if we do migrate to it. So that, um, now that we have reason with our new architecture, we want to get back to how this really helped us with testing and what else we did to make writing testers as easy as a piece of cake. First of all, our architecture helped us answer the questions about boundaries. With a clean architecture, we have clearly defined boundaries and we're now in a better position to unit test each layer independently of each other. Things only really need to be tested up to the boundary with the use of mocks and stops. So, mocks and stops, um, they help us out in a couple of ways. They help us have fast tests because everything can kind of run at unit test speed. Um, so that helps kind of increase coverage because adding a new test doesn't kind of exponentially increase our build time. And it allows us to have more robust tests. Um, so kind of how? You can think of it kind of in a real world scenario. Um, a vehicle kind of manufacturer might kind of do um, a vehicle collision scenario testing and they'll use a um, crash test dummy instead. So, this means that we can use mocks and stubs in our um, application when testing to simulate things like error conditions and exceptions reliably. We don't need to depend th on things out of our control, like the network and how long it takes to respond. And kind of as a result of this, it means that we can reduce the com complexity of the subject under test. And this, of course, we don't need to touch or worry about parts of the system that not, are not related to the thing that we actually care about, um, the, thing, the, thing, the thing that we're testing. But, you know, in Swift, we couldn't find any kind of mocking libraries out there kind of that existed in Objective-C land. So we kind of had to go about it a different way. And it actually turns out you can kind of achieve the same behavior if you kind of follow two key things. The first one is to use dependency injection. And the second one is to use protocols and follow the concept of protocol-oriented programming. So Carol will go through these next. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you um, have gone through talks about protocol random programming and DI, but we're still going to go through it again. Um, so dependent injection, what is it? So it's actually really simple. There's a simple definition of the screen, and I'm going to go through it with a simple analogy. Given a chicken, depending on how you cook it, you can create different recipes. You're laughing? OK, for example, you can fry it or you can steam it. And whether we choose to fry or steam, the cooking methods are just a single dependency of recipes. There are often other dependencies in the cooking process, such as marinating. We can represent cooking and marinating collectively as functions of a single cooking service. And how do we express this in Swift? We don't really care about all the details. We just need to know that cooking service performs two functions. We can represent this really easily using a protocol. Protocol gives us a type or an interface. Depending on which concrete cooking service class we inject into our cooking, we can yield different end result. 
And about injecting, we usually inject dependencies in two ways. We either inject um, the entire service into the constructor, or we can pass in just that function as Swift support um, passing function as first class citizens. And either way, we try to avoid having any singletons or static shared instance, um, such as what we'll do in Objective-C, for any classes. And now with our test code, uh, we can easily stub out dependencies by writing a sub that conforms to the same protocol of, that the production code uses. You do not have to know anything about the implementation of cooking service or cook to do this. And unlike subclassing, mocking with protocol plays well with structs and classes, and you do not have to accept stored properties <coughs> of your superclass. And with this type of programming, you now have one consistent approach to creating stops and mocks throughout your code base. Using DI and protocol programming has huge impact on the entire app's testability. If you want to know more about this topic, um, you can go through the talks that has been gone through, or um, there's two talks uh, this year and last year with WWDC. That is really good. So let's talk about those integration tests that cause us a bit of grief. Um, so it turns out what we're actually aiming to do now is remove them. And that's because our integration tests are, consisted of a test hitting a backend server. And the main premise um, was to test that the integration from X to Y worked, so that the integration from our iOS app to our backend environments um, you know, kind of worked successfully. And the reason for this was the motivation was to have, for the team to have confidence that the app being released into the wild worked. One of our kind of main fears was re releasing an app that failed for a critical function that a merchant or one of the businesses wanted to do um, due to something like a serialization <coughs> issue. Yet, when we had sat back and kind of evaluated our test stack and the different tests we had, we soon realized that some of the tests that we introduced um, later down the track to our development, like UI tests, um, they provided some of that coverage already. And our pack test, which we also introduced later, um, gave us the rest of that confidence. And so, Let's talk about kind of what pack testing is. Does anyone in the audience know or have heard about pack tests? Yeah, okay, so some of you do? Cool. So it essentially is a form of consumer-driven contract testing between dependent systems. And what that does for us is it removes our need to have our integration tests depend on a real backend, or in the case of our tests, a backend simulator. And by removing this dependency on the, on the backend simulator, we can again reduce compl complexity. We don't have to set up the simulator anymore, and we don't have to wait for network calls to return from it. So how does it work? There's two sides to pack. There's the consumer side, um, which the consumer for us is the iPhone app, because it's, it's the kind of consumer that talks to back in API. And what happens is you define a bunch of tests as just standard unit tests, so they run quick. And as part of those tests, um, you kind of record what you expect your provider, your backend, to fulfill. So in a banking app, that you might need to do an action like transferring funds. And so that kind of API is going to take a set of data, and you're going to expect it to return back maybe a 200. Um, so everything's awesome. So you write that as part of your unit test, and it gets recorded, and it gets published. It gets published to a server somewhere else, and we'll come back to that later. So then on the other side, there's the provider. And it's our kind of um, backend system that's the gateway into kind of Tyra's microservices. And it runs a unit test as well. And the unit test that it runs is to basically verify those expectations that were published previously. So as part of its unit test, it will grow for this server that the contract's being, the expectations have been published with. It will pull them down, <coughs> and it will play it, back, play it back against itself. And if the provider fails to be able to meet the expectations that any of the consumers have kind of published, the unit test will fail. So kind of even though both the consumer and the provider, the iOS app and the back end, are running separate unit tests. We get the same confidence. A test does fail if the integration is broken. The last piece of the puzzle is UI tests. Um, if you went through, uh, went to Sammy's presentation on this topic, then you know all about it already. But I'm still going to give it a recap. So on this, we take on something called a risk-based approach. So risk-based risk -based testing is not really new. In Dan North's presentation in 2013, we learned that we should look at important bits of the product and see what makes sense. And we should test, give a lot of tests to the things that are high likelihood of failure and high impact if it failed, um, compared to things that no one really cared about. And the most important thing here to note is that we should always include our stakeholders and product owners to be part of the team. 
so that they can tell us what is important and therefore we can appreciate the context. In general, happy paths are the most crucial um, as that those are what the users, most users will see and naturally be the focus of our functional tests. But if there are tests that appear to like 5% of the users, you can still write them and maybe run them overnight or something. And as a quick note, we'd like to mention that you can make a test builder quite easily in Swift um, if you're used to working with one in Java. So test, test builders help us um, create test data easily. They have really clean setup, and that is really important as we treat tests as a living document. And it can also reduce noises and extra things that might screw up the test. For example, you want to create a chef object as test data, but you don't want to call the long constructor every time or mess with programs that you don't really care about. And this is how you can create a test builder with um, extension and class function built on top of it. And also note <coughs> that the um, params have optional and default values, so that um, they will be that default if you don't provide them. And we'll also touch a bit kind of on the testing libraries we use on kind of a day, day basis. So because we're a mixed language app, um, in the Objective-C code, we use OCMOC, because OCMOC is supported. And we use Xvector as our matching framework instead of the XC test asserts. Um, on the Swift side, no mocking framework, uh, but we use Nimble, which was mentioned in the TDD workshop on Monday. The reason we've chosen um, to use Xvector and Nimble um, as opposed to using kind of the asserts built in XC test is that we found as a team that the code reads more fluently. So it reads more fluently, so it reads like a sentence. So someone who's reading our tests, and tests are a living documentation, can easily tell kind of what the initial developer intended the behavior of the test and the application to be. Then on the DI side, uh, we don't use kind of a DI framework um, right now because we have a bit more kind of cleanup to do to kind of get to the place that we can hopefully drop one in, but it is one of our longer term goals. But for those of you who are starting a project from scratch, you actually might want to consider using a, a DI framework such as Typhoon, Swinjack, or Squares Cleanse. And for those of you who may be doing Android as well, it also has DI frameworks out there. So what does our app architecture look like with regards to testing kind of now? We've got studs and spies on, studs and spies on either side of the boundary. So I haven't touched too much on spies, but it's essentially a um, form of test double. And we use them so that we can inspect that certain behavior has been called, because that's all we care about, that that, that particular action um, happened. And we rely predominantly on unit tests to kind of cover most of our test scenarios and test behavior. And then kind of at the very edges now for the integration aspect, we just rely on UI and task. And in short, we find that it's a lot better approach for us than what we did previously. So we'll kind of go through a kind of very simple kind of high level scenario of how um, this approach that we're doing kind of at Tyra might, you know, might be used on kind of a code base, a simple code base. So the first thing is, um, any of your controllers conform to a viewport protocol. And so the viewport essentially defines um, the function that a controller will have to implement to get notified when there's a new view model to be displayed. So it pretty much just looks right. Um, something else is that um, dependencies get provided. So it seems that Pokemon is all the rage. Um, so we have Pokemon 2. Um, <coughs> So our Pokemon search service is not a concrete implementation, um, but it's a protocol. And so this means in terms of kind of when we're doing tests, we could substitute the actual implementation with something else. In real life, the search service might need to talk, off, talk to a network, talk to a back-end system, but maybe for testing, um, you just want to use something that's in memory and has can value back for the purpose of testing. Another thing that um, our controls have is a reference to a view adapter, and that kind of gets the service um, provided as well. So how does it work? Um, so I had a table view um, controller um, before that. And in you know, typical iOS fashion, um, your class might start like that, and then it suddenly becomes a massive um, view controller if you're learning off the documentation. So it's like this, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but instead, now, all we need to do is kind of go, hey, view adapter, an event called view did load um, happened. Um, go and do whatever you need to do. I don't really care. And from the view adapter side, it didn't really have any reference to the view controller. So it doesn't know who called it. If you kind of, you know, look just outside the iOS ecosystem for a while and apply the approach, you can kind of think of there could be anything calling the view adapter. It could be um, a web service front end. It could be a website. It really doesn't care. So 
So, <coughs> how does the adapter then handle kind of being called? Well, it basically handles the event by doing what it needs to do. So, um, in this case, it's going to go um, to the network, um, or in this case, in memory service, um, uh, coded, and it's going to do what it needs to do, search the Pokemon, and then it's going to populate a new view model. But it needs to get that new view model back to the guy who fired the event. And it does that by using the protocol, um, which is the viewport. Refresh with result. And so a couple of things about this is um, the search service is again provided. So if we wanted to unit test this, we could substitute it for something else. Um, it doesn't have any dependencies on UI, um, UI here. So we don't have to worry about kind of any kind of Apple, um, Apple libraries kind of being here that we have to handle. And kind of just those two things alone made, made it a lot more easily to unit test. Um, so this is what our field model will look like. Uh, we make sure it's implemented with struct and we create it every time so it's immutable. Um, and it transforms our Pokemon result into format displayable on a simple title description table view cell. But we don't really care because we don't import UIKit. And um, also um, we can unit test this and also all of its primitive objects and making sure that uh, it kind of separates all the suburbs that the Pokemon appears in. And this is what the field adapter unit test will look like. Um, as the field adapter would work with any UI or field part uh, plugged in, we can test our assumptions using a spy on the field part. And we can um, uh, ignore the dependency of the Pokemon service using a stop that we have. And now that we have this in place, we can write a lot of these uh, unit tests in all variations so that we can test um, what would happen in all scenarios of build it load event. And again, this is only possible because we are using two things, uh, dependency injection and protocol oriented programming. And we have this architecture in place. So finally, using this architecture, we achieved two very important goals. We increase our uh, test uh, execution time and build time, drop down from 30 minutes to 10 minutes. By thinking about testability and refactoring, we're able to even speed up parts of the, uh, of the app that we didn't really plan to touch on. And secondly, it was just an important to have an architecture that is easy to follow for all the developers and all the new developers that would join the team. Um, it does not provide any overhead, so if you don't want to really migrate from MVC to MVVM or this um, hierarchy, uh, to this architecture, you don't really have to. And our advice is, think about what architecture really suits you. If you care about developing an app that needs to be maintained by a number of developers, and if your app fails and it um, breaks your reputation, so care about testing as they're living documents and every developer can make a change with confidence. And that is our presentation. Thank <laughs> you.